So we were talking about um, states of matter. Let's talk about state, some state changes. So evaporation or vaporization, those are just two different words for exactly the same process. That's a physical change where something goes from a liquid to a gas state. So the rate of vaporization, how fast something evaporates, is going to depend on three things. It will depend on the surface area. So we have experience with things like this in real life. So think of water. If you had a cup of water sitting in a glass on the counter, and you took another cup of water and you spilled it on the floor, so it's spread out all over the place. Which one's going to evaporate faster? The one on the floor, because it's got more surface area. So more surface area allows the liquid to evaporate faster. Increasing the temperature. Say you have... Um, so you have two wet towels, and you put one in the refrigerator, and you put the other in the dryer. Which one's going to get dry faster, the warm one or the cold one? The warm one, because warm water evaporates faster than cold water. So if we increase the temperature of something, that increases the rate at which it evaporates. The other thing that affects rate of evaporation or vaporization is the strength of the intermolecular forces. If those molecules are held together tightly, it will evaporate slower than if they are not held together tightly. We'll look at a picture in a minute. And here's another new word, volatile. So liquids that evaporate easily are, are considered to be volatile. They evaporate easily. And something that doesn't is non-volatile. So alcohol is considered volatile. Gasoline is volatile. Um, something that's non-volatile would be something like vegetable oil. Vegetable oil does not evaporate. Not at a rate that we can even notice at all. And water's kind of in between. So let's look at evaporation. Here's a, a beaker with water in it. So we've got molecules at the surface, and they are held, we, we learned in our discussion of surface tension, they are held by molecules next to them and molecules under them. But they don't have as many other particles holding on to them as molecules down here in the interior of the liquid do. And some of the molecules up here are able to escape. Let's, let's jump ahead and look at this uh, graph here. So at a given temperature, let's look at this blue one. At a given temperature, um, there's an average kinetic energy. But some molecules are higher in energy and some are lower. And so on this graph, this line represents the amount of energy needed to escape. So those particles are being held by these intermolecular forces, but if you're moving fast enough, you can break free. I, I forgot to use this analogy for my students yesterday. This is a little bit like playing Red Rover. Do you guys ever play Red Rover? Bunch of students hold hands. I don't think they let them do this anymore in school because somebody might get hurt. Good grief. Anyway, a bunch of kids hold hands. And you got kids over there, and somebody says, Red Rover, Red Rover, send Susie right over. And Susie runs across the grass and tries to break through your hands. Well, the people in the Red Rover line are like the people, I'm sorry, the people, the molecules at the surface of the liquid. And the strength of, of your grip on the next person is like the intermolecular forces. And so you're being, you're holding together. And so when you've got someone running at you, what's more effective, running fast or running slow? Running fast. The faster you can run, the bigger you are, the more kinetic energy you have, the more likely you are to get through. So there's a range of kinetic energies among those particles. Some of them are moving faster. And so some of them have enough energy to escape. 
So when those higher energy molecules get to the surface, they're able to escape and go into the gas state. If we increase the temperature, so the blue is the lower temperature, if we increase the temperature, now we're shifting the, the kinetic energy, and so more particles, the average now would probably be in here somewhere, the average kinetic energy has increased. And so now we have more particles that have this higher energy that have enough to escape. So more of them are running faster, more of them can get out. So let's go back to this picture. So here we have, imagine these molecules at the surface are like the red rover line, and these other guys are trying to get out. So if they have enough kinetic energy to break through the intermolecular force holding them in, they can escape into the gas state. So if you increase the temperature, then more of them are going to have enough energy to get out. Or if you have a liquid where the intermolecular forces are weaker, then more of these will be able to escape. Because if you've got kindergartners in the Red Rover line versus, you know, linebackers from the football team, it's going to be hard to get through the linebacker line because those guys are strong. The kindergartners aren't. Okay? And so the weak force, easier to get through. Low intermolecular forces, higher rate of evaporation. Does that make sense? So it's the particles trying to escape. That's evaporation. Condensation is the opposite. That's where a substance goes from the gas state to the liquid state. So evaporation and condensation are opposites. And so we can have a dynamic equilibrium established, and this is one of the reasons why I skipped ahead to chapter 15. We know what that is now, don't we? Two processes moving in the opposite direction. And when the rates of each of those becomes equal, we have a dynamic equilibrium. And then we'll talk about vapor pressure. The vapor pressure is the partial pressure of a vapor, a gas, in equilibrium with its liquid. So let's look at a container. So here's an Erlenmeyer flask with a stopper. And we've got some water in here. And initially, there's nothing up here. There's no, there's no water up here. So we put the water in here. And what happens? It begins to evaporate, because that's what water does. So some of these particles have enough energy to escape. And so they're evaporating, and they're evaporating into the gas state. But this container is closed. And so what do these gas particles do? Well, they bounce around, hitting each other and hitting the walls. And eventually, they're going to run into the surface again. When they run into the surface, then they get trapped. That's condensation gas particle running into the surface of the water, and now it's a liquid again. So the rate of evaporation is constant. That's depending on the surface area, the temperature, and the strength of the intermolecular forces. We're not heating this flask up. The surface area isn't changing, and the intermolecular forces aren't changing. So rate of evaporation is constant. The rate of condensation, though, is going to depend on the number of particles we have up here. Remember we said the rate of a reaction depends on the concentration of the reactants. If you have more reactants, more will react. And so the more molecules you have up here, the more will condense. So we've got this constant rate of evaporation, and the rate of condensation increases as we get more and more up here. But at some point, they will be equal, and we have a dynamic equilibrium. Maybe we have five molecules per second evaporating and five molecules per second condensing. So we end up with the same number of gas particles all the time, although it's not the same gas particles. New ones are coming into the gas state and old ones are leaving. Well, what did we learn about gases? Gases exert pressures on their containers. There is now water vapor here, and that water vapor has a pressure. That is called the vapor pressure. And the vapor pressure will depend on the temperature only. Because what happens to this rate of evaporation if we increase the temperature? It increases, right? Because more particles have enough energy to escape. The rate of evaporation increases. And so we're going to get more particles up here 
until the rate of condensation is equal to the rate of evaporation. But the result will be more particles here. So the higher the temperature, the higher the vapor pressure. Does that make sense? Any questions? Vapor pressure increases with increasing temperature. And if you compare two different liquids, and one has low intermolecular forces and one has strong intermolecular forces, the one with strong intermolecular forces will have a lower rate of evaporation because fewer people are able to get through the Red Rover line because it's the linebackers and they're holding tough, right? And if you have one that has weak intermolecular forces, the kindergartners, almost everybody can get through. So higher rate of evaporation yields a higher vapor pressure. The vapor pressure is not dependent. It's independent of the surface area because if you increase the surface area, you increase the rate of evaporation, but you also increase the rate of condensation. And so it doesn't affect the vapor pressure. So vapor pressure depends on temperature. And if you're comparing different liquids, it'll depend on the strength of the intermolecular forces. I think the best way to be able to answer questions about this is to be able to think about what the particles are doing. Okay, so if the intermolecular forces are weaker, what does that mean? Well, that means that more of them can get through. So it evaporates faster. Well, then we end up with more particles in the gas state, so then the vapor pressure must be higher. Boiling. Um, the boiling point of a liquid is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of a liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure. We were just talking about how vapor pressure increases with temperature. So the vapor pressure increases and increases and increases and eventually gets to the point where the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure above the liquid. And when that happens, the molecules have enough thermal energy that even the ones inside can enter the gas state and they'll form gas bubbles. So now we have even molecules way down here in this boiling water, they have enough energy and so they'll enter the gas state and form bubbles of water vapor that will then go to the surface and, and get released. Um, Let's see where to talk about this. Well, let's let's stay right here. So at the boiling point, the vapor pressure of the liquid equals the pressure above it. So what would happen if you decreased the va the the atmospheric pressure? How would that affect the boiling point? Would decrease the boiling point. Because as you're raising the temperature, the vapor pressure will equal the atmospheric pressure sooner. Okay? So if you boil water up in the mountains, it doesn't boil at 100 degrees. It might boil at like 95 degrees, depending on your elevation. And that's why like on cake mixes and stuff, they have high altitude directions. Because if you go to cook something in water that is cooler than normal for boiling water, it's going to take longer, and so you have to alter the recipe. You know what a pressure cooker is? Pressure cooker is a pot with a lid that clamps on, and then it's got a little vent and a gauge so that you don't, like, blow it up. But when you, when you heat up a liquid in a pressure cooker, you're causing evaporation, but the the particles can't ex escape, and so pressure builds up. So now you're increasing the pressure in this container. What does that do to the boiling point of the water? It makes it go up. If you increase the atmospheric pressure, it increases the boiling point. So water boils at 100 degrees, and we'll see that um, that, that is so. And so if you're cooking something in boiling water, it doesn't matter how high you have the heat turned up, the temperature is the same in the boiling water. In a pressure cooker, you can make water boil at a higher temperature, and so that'll cause your food to cook faster. So that's the advantage of a pressure cooker. 
Once the boiling point of liquid is reached, additional heating only causes more rapid boiling. It does not cause the temperature to increase. And this is something that's a little weird if you haven't thought about it before. So pot of boiling water. If it just started boiling or it's been boiling for 10 minutes, if you have it on a little burner in your, sto in your kitchen, on your stove, or if you have it on a big outdoor burner that's got just tons of heat, the temperature of the water is the same. It stays at 100 degrees until all of it has converted into steam. Because which particles are moving out into the gas state? The ones with more energy or less energy? The ones with more energy. So when this is boiling, the higher energy particles are leaving. Then what's left? The lower energy particles. And so because the higher energy particles are leaving, that, that keeps the average kinetic energy the same until everything has evaporated. So this is what we call a heating curve. Here's the temperature. And this would be, you know, we're adding heat. It could be related to amount of time. And so we start out with water at room temperature, and we add heat to it, and the temperature goes up. And the particles are moving faster and faster and faster, and the vapor pressure is increasing. And here we get to 100 degrees, and now the vapor pressure equals the external pressure, and more particles you know, are able to escape. And when we get here, the temperature does not rise. It just flattens out, and it stays at 100 degrees Celsius as this change of state is occurring. Once all the liquid has evaporated or boiled and become a gas, then the temperature will rise. So we'll talk more about that on Friday.